So our first speaker is Matthew Chalou, who's a research fellow at uh, uh, the, uh, that is the information in the, in the bio had it wrong, at Curtin University. And he's worked on uh, Foucault, applying his analysis of power and knowledge to human-animal interaction. He's focused specifically on the figure of the mammoth and uh, is associate editor of Environmental Humanities, among other things, and also a, an author of uh, several works of uh, fiction. So I'll turn it over to you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you heaps to Brett. Where is Brett? And the rest of the uh, committee for inviting such an interesting group of people and me um, here to this uh, wonderful place. So, um, uh, yeah, the program didn't get it wrong. It's just only very recently changed. So, uh, I'm now a curtain. So, um, what I want to talk about is, uh, is the idea of uh, behaviour um, and thinking more, a bit more about animal behaviour as part of the, uh, the elements of extinction and of responding to extinction, um, which I think it's very easy to, to move over a little quickly. Um, so the, the context of my remarks are that, are the, the, that we are in an extinction event and that this is something that we have to respond to. So this is, this is uh, something I take for given and that I take as sort of the impetus of the work of, of so many of us here. Um, but I think we also need to uh, be wary of conceding the nature of our response to this extinction event to um, uh, certain forms of whether only technological or bureaucratic and managerial responses to it. I think we need to uh, have a, a more holistic way of uh, thinking about and, and, and responding um, to extinction. I think we need to be able to tell extinction stories and uh, counter extinction stories in a, in, a, in a wider range of ways than perhaps we always do. Um, so uh, I'm interested in a range of uh, scientific and managerial responses to extinction or counter extinction practices uh, such as conservation biology and habitat protection in situ management um, as well as captive breeding, genetic resource banking and rewilding and reintroduction and de-extinction. All of these things count as different forms of counter extinction uh, practices and I think there's, there's forms of hope in all of them, but there's also dangers uh, in all of them. And uh, I think part of what we need to do is to try to avoid all of the worst dangers and, and try to nurture all the best hopes in them. So uh, I guess the exercise is, is merely one in problematizing uh, the, the nature of our counter extinction uh, practices. So uh, I thought I'd better give a quick overview of where I'm uh, going. So I'll talk a bit about uh, uh, zoos and the critiques uh, of the, the artifice of zoos uh, from some thinkers um, and uh, adding a bit to what uh, Mick was saying a couple of days ago, talk about the other ways of perhaps thinking about uh, zoos and other hybrid human animal communities. Um, the overarching uh, idea of, the, of my analysis of zoos is, is under the, uh, the, the concept of biopolitics. And I'll talk about uh, Heine Hedegger's uh, 20th century zoo uh, director and biologist um, and his, the way in which he uh, uh, altered uh, practices in zoos. And then I'll take an example of the, the Golden Lion Tamarind project uh, and talk about the, this, the reintroductions uh, to Brazilian rainforest and the, as experiments in behaviour and uh, the ways in which uh, they, they give and, and, and take death um, from these animals before moving on to the idea of plasticity. So, uh, that's where we are. Um, so the the uh, there's a lot of interesting books out there. Uh, one of them written by one of the, the people that we have here. Um, this is a guy called Stephen Spot, uh, who uh, was a, a, a director of a zoo, I believe, or of an aquarium. Um, and normally, the way these battles go, when you have the critiques by humanists of, of zoological gardens and then you have the scientists defending and say what are you talking about it's all simulation these are real animals and so you've got that, that sort of typical uh, debate um, but uh, Spot who was a zoo director interestingly 
um, when he wrote his book on the zoos, went straight to Baudrillard and uh, theories of simulation and simulacra and, um, and, and right into the, the universe of signs and so on. Um, and these are just a couple of representative quotes of the nature of his uh, critique of the artifice of uh, zoological gardens. Um, so one of his hypotheses is that animals held captive in these facilities have relinquished zoological status as part of the natural world. Unable to reproduce as they might in nature, to expand their ranges and to evolve, they can only simulate their wild conspecifics. Now reduced to static objects, we then view them as spectacles. And this is probably a familiar critique of what is that goes on in zoos that you, that you might have heard. Um, at another point, he, he, talk, uh, he says, releasing captive bred specimens into the wild perpetuates artificiality because the animals themselves are second order simulations, having been conceived, born, and reared under controlled conditions. The subsequent release into what for them is now an alien environment establishes still another level of simulation, particularly if subsequent observation, taking, monitoring, or some other form of interference is called for. Only as the other can nature exist apart from us, compromise is impossible. Um, so, uh, Spot ha has uh, a problem with the artificiality of zoos and from there with the artificiality that, that become, gets extended into nature with, for example, reintroductions and management and so on. Um, and I, there's, there's, uh, there's something about these arguments that we want to say, well, yeah, there is a level of artificiality or artifice, there is a level of human intervention and so on. But he, there's also a, a major problem with the way he's thinking, I think, because he's still too caught up in this dualism of, of culture and, and nature, of, of um, humanity and the wild, and the, the only way he can conceive of nature is as an other that exists apart from us with the possibility of compromise being impossible. Uh, and this type of um, separation between uh, the human and the natural is something that's uh, been contested in a lot of humanities scholarship recently as well as in a lot of scientific scholarship. So the, the concept of the Anthropocene, for example, is just one uh, way in which the, uh, you know, we can see that it's not only the uh, postmodernists who are wanting to deconstruct that dualism, the geologists uh, are doing it now as well. Um, so uh, I, think, I think we want to be able to think what's going on with zoos and with practices like endangered species re reintroduction in a, um, in a more sophisticated way than to, to, to simply say that this is just artificiality being perpetuated in nature and we have lost uh, all idea of the natural. Um, and so this is a, another recent uh, book on zoos by Keacock uh, Lee uh, and her, I think, analysis is similar. Um, I think she's right to to ask the ontological questions, um, um, but it, it takes a very similar, similar track. So that the ontological status of animals in zoos is different from that of animals in the wild. The former are not wild, amount of what may be called biotic artifacts, and they constitute the ontological foil to the latter. Excuse me. And the second one uh, basically says the same thing. So a similar sort of analysis. Um, I think the, what we want to be able to do is to get, uh, yeah, like I said, to get to a point where we can, we can think through uh, in some more detail exactly what's going on with uh, the, the, the artificiality of zoo animals and of uh, reintroduction processes. Um, so uh, one way in which we might begin to do that is to rethink the notion of community. And I think that's what Mick was uh, trying to do a, a couple of days ago, is to try to uh, think community not only in political and human terms, but in ecological uh, and animal terms as well. Um, and so this is a, a one thinker who uh, Brad and Jeff and Deb and some others have been working on, who talks about uh, hybrid human-animal communities as, uh, as sort of necessary to all societies. All human societies, he argues, have been hybrid human-animal communities um, and uh, we can probably think of zoos as well as uh, managed uh, in situ reintroduction projects as hybrid human animal communities of some form and then the, the task might be to go on from there to think about what type of uh, community is this. So all human societies are also animal societies, the Stella argues. In general, we find discussions of one or the other, but little exists on the group consisting of one and the other. 
and the ambiguous concept of domestication, he says, or perhaps of artificiality, too often replaces any characterization of the interfaces. And that's sort of the phrase that might capture what I'm trying to do, is to characterize these interfaces, is to try to talk about uh, what's going on. Um, study of animal societies is seen as a natural science and of human society as a social science. And he wants to break down these, uh, these barriers. We need to develop an authentic ethology that would study how humans and animals live together. Um, of course, part of, part of the description of uh, the types of human-animal hybrid communities that we find in zoos and in uh, wild reintroduction projects, uh, the same as in laboratories, which is part of his work, is going to be that they are the type of communities in which the humans want to pretend that they are not part of a community with animals. They try to erase themselves from the entire process. This is what goes on in a laboratory. This is what goes on in a zoo. So at the same time as being heavily involved with and intervening in the lives of the animals, they want to erase their own impact on uh, the animals. And so this is the, the particular type of hybrid human animal communities that uh, modern Western scientific culture uh, 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 practices. Um, so for, for example, in one of his early books, he looks at uh, the ape language experiments and argues that these are um, the interesting thing going on here is not trying to discover whether or not uh, primates have language. What's actually happening in these laboratories is that scientists, uh, along with primates, are creating languages with which they communicate with each other. So this, this laboratory is a form of hybrid human community in which forms of communication are being created rather than an experiment to try to determine whether or not primates have, without humans, some sort of language. So that's the, so how would we extend that analysis to, to zoos and uh, reintroduction? So he goes on, um, a hybrid human animal community is a fellowship of men and animals in a given culture, which is a living space for some and for others in which interests, emotions, and meaning are shared. And, and this approach, he says, privileges association over competition. So it's not just the idea of uh, evolutionary competition, as Mick was uh, pointing out, talking about Haeckel. Um, uh, but that does not mean, and this is some of the questions that, that came up in response to that paper, about how do we still distinguish what, you know, the, the different stratifications, for example. Um, with, but, he says, these are still organised around a few fundamental asymmetries. The human always has a power of decision over the animal that is not reciprocated. And there is also, for example, asymmetry in the assessment of each other's cognitive skills. So our ability to actually understand what the animals, that we're, who we are living with, are saying uh, is often quite heavily compromised. And so there's a, it doesn't mean that communication is always occurring um, or that we, we always know what's going on. Is, oh, there's the clock. All right. So I'm going to start moving a bit quicker, I think. Um, so, okay, so that I'm trying to bring a few things together. So excuse me if it doesn't all hold together uh, in, in immediately. Um, so in thinking of the zoo, I'm using uh, Foucault's uh, idea of biopolitics, which is uh, that in modern societies, uh, uh, life is subject to power. So what, what uh, contemporary power does is attempt to... <coughs> to nurture life rather than, rather than giving death, it, uh, it gives life. Um, I'll move on through that quickly if I can. And just to say that for the, the, uh, the modern biopolitical society, which is the one of statistics of uh, human health, of uh, the you know, medical apparatus and so on, where we need to uh, understand all the, the diseases, we need to understand you know, all the different aspects of life in order to optimise health and life. This is the, the, the kind of society uh, that the relationship to death can often change um, in strange ways. And the, the problem of extinction, I think, is one that leads to uh, contortions in the biopolitical practice. Because this is a this is a fundamental problem. The, the, the ex potential extinction of an entire species or an entire population um, leads leads power to do crazy things in attempts to respond to it. Um, so I'll probably just say that at this point. Um, the yeah extinction being as uh, 
Joshua was telling us only it's only a recent idea. It's only something that that even became uh, knowable to Western scientists in the last couple hundred years as as something that could even happen. Um, Immunisation is one that I wanted to uh, just to make sure was in there. So part of uh, what politics wants to do, part of what biopolitics needs to do is to keep life alive. Right? So it's the, the possibility or the instrument for keeping life alive. This is the uh, further analysis of Esposito, an Italian philosopher, um, and he tries to think this through, the idea of immunisation, uh, not only in a medical term but in a political term as well. Um, he says is a negative form of the protection of life. It saves, ensures and preserves the organism, either individual or collective, to which it pertains, but it does not do so directly, immediately or frontally. On the contrary, it subjects the organism to a condition that simultaneously negates or reduces its power to expand. Um, we might think, for example, of frozen zoos and uh, genetic resource banking as, a, as an attempt to immunise a species against uh, potential loss potential death, potential mortality, um, a, a form so extreme in that it, it, it separates the genetic code of the species from all you know, possible mortality or loss, everything that comes along with actually living. You know, we don't need to bother about the, the, the risks and exposure to genetic loss, uh, to multiple generations, to predation that go on with living because we can secure and immunise the species in these frozen uh, capsules. Um, so yeah, so we're wanting to save life from natural risks using artificial procedures. Okay, so very quickly on Heidegger. Um, Heidegger was a 20th century uh, zoo director and biologist who ha I argue had a major part in transforming the way zoos uh, thought about and uh, took care of the animals that they, they had. Uh, so he was, uh, his work is all concerned with knowing as much as we can about the animals. This might seem obvious to you, this is not always the way in which zoos thought about uh, their, their charges. We need to uh, have knowledge, statistics about their uh, mortality, about their life, about their diseases and health and, and so on in order to do everything that we can uh, to care for them. Um, the, I've published a couple of things on Hedega, so I'll, I'll just point you in that direction. Um, part of the reason I want to uh, bring up this sort of historical dimension is to understand uh, the changes that zoos have gone through in the 20th century when they became these you know, conservation uh, institutions. I think probably firstly as a matter of uh, justification and then secondly as a matter of sort of uh, having to put their money where their mouth is and developing the techniques to actually do what they said is their, is, is what they say is their goal. Um, so, uh, Heidegger um, is sort of the, the for me, the chief uh, biopolitician of, of the zoo, of uh, making sure that they, they uh, conform to this scientific uh, mode. Um, I did have an argument about, uh, I'm wondering. How long do I have to? I plan to go till quarter to. Oh, okay. Morning. All right. So, all right. So, what I'm wanting to think about is the uh, the idea of that behaviour became at, at one point a domain of knowledge, behaviour as a domain of knowledge and a domain of power and intervention, and that this wasn't always the case. So, in the care of animals in the zoo, uh, it wasn't always the case that the the carers knew things about the specificity of the behaviour of the animals that they're caring about. This had to go through a process of becoming a problem for their keepers and becoming operationalised as something we need to, to know about and to do, to do things about. So there is this process by which behaviour becomes a problem and it becomes a domain of intervention and Heidegger plays a big part, of, uh, a big part uh, in this. Um, and for example, he would do everything he could to ensure that, that, uh, that deaths were absolutely minimised and particularly deaths caused by the animals behaving in a certain way. For example, fearful responses to keepers or to visitors and so on. We need to know how they're going to behave in these situations so that we can uh, prepare and immunise against the possible harmful effects of this captive situation that we've created. Um, so uh, it's through Heidegger, I'm arguing that there is this 
this domain of behaviour become, becomes a problem. Um, but also in thinking of animal behaviour, there's a, I think there's a, a, a tendency to, um, to think often that the problem is only one, the problem in thinking animal behaviour is only one of, uh, of mechanism and the sort of the Cartesian problem. Um, so we, we have this, uh, for example, if you read uh, Derrida's recent work on the animal, it's very much a critique of the history of uh, the way Cartesian ideas about animals as machines have been played out in the history of philosophy. Um, and there are other great works, particularly Eileen's book, who, uh, which everyone should read, on uh, the way in which uh, animal behaviour scientists themselves have uh, described animals in such a way as to uh, occlude their cognition and mentality and to, to remove that from uh, awareness so that you know, we see them just as these instinctual, programmable, behaviourist machines of some form. And so there's a sort of Cartesian element through the history of animal behaviour scientists as well. And I think, I think both of these analyses are, are correct. Um, I, also, I also think there is... Uh, there's, there's more to it because it's not only the case that uh, when you recognise that animals are thinking and behaving and uh, at creatures with their own worlds, uh, that, the, that the problems go away. And it, because in fact, uh, there, are, there are ways in which uh, the knowledge of and the behaviour of animals itself becomes operationalised as uh, the domain of power. And, all, and what it allows is simply more effective control and more effective um, killing. Uh, Heidegger, for example, in, you know, he would use the same sort of knowledge of animals that he used to care for his animal charges to kill all the rats in his zoo. And it was, it was precisely because he understood the worlds of the rats, not because he th saw them as machines, but because he understood how they think, where they would run, how they would respond in certain circumstances that he would lay his traps in such a fashion as, as to wipe them out. So it's not only... Um, it's not only, power does not only take this repressive form of turning animals into machines, power can also see them as uh, subjects with lives and creating worlds and precisely through that uh, act in, in more, intervene on them in, in more effective ways. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll move on from there to so the example. So I'm sure uh, many of you already know about the Saving the Golden Lion Tamarind project and some I think are uh, involved in it. Um, so this is one of the more famous examples of uh, endangered species reintroduction of zoos that were uh, captive born and captive bred uh, that were reintroduced into Brazilian rainforest um, as part of this, uh, this uh, famous program. Um, so I won't talk too much about the specifics of it or them. Um, uh, only to point out that this is the uh, the mascot for the Olympics, I believe, in 2016. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that's the actual mascot. I know the, the, the tamarind is a mascot. This is a sort of Obama poster of the tamarind. Um, I think I think though, there's uh, if, I, if we wanted to to think about immunisation and biopolitics, as I was talking about before, um, and analysis. What's the, what? Scary. No, 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 no. Okay. Minus, minus, minus. okay. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the connection I'd want to make is um, if we're thinking about uh, biopolitics and immunisation um, in, in, in terms of contemporary uh, politics in, in, the, in the US, there are, the forms of counter-terrorism can themselves become a problem. Right? I think we sort of have seen how that has occurred. So you have the problem of terrorism, which might be analogous to that of extinction. The ways in which responses to terrorism occur can themselves uh, have be, be attempts to immunise the population in ways that sort of sacrifice the, the population itself. Okay, so these are the, the sort of twists in which uh, biopolitical power can, can respond to, uh, to threats. Um, so the yes we can goes from this really hopeful statement to yes we can do whatever we want. Um, and, and I think we can ask that question of you know, what can we do with golden lion tamarinds as well. Um, so this is 
uh, Benjamin Beck, who's a, a, a behaviorist and, and, and zoobiologist as well. Um, I, I like this uh, photo, um, which is, I think is very carefully staged and which sort of shows the, the, the you know, the, the rules don't quite apply to a guy like Benjamin Beck. You know, he, the, the, the division between the natural and the cultural, he, he is a human participant on the, you know, out there. Um, and and he, under, he understands enough, he clearly, uh, to, to be out there um, intervening in ways that, that aren't going to be too problematic. Um, so the other interesting thing about this is that he has, he has written a novel. So uh, he was involved in this uh, reintroduction program over a number of years. I think it started in the early 80s. And so uh, he's been a big part of this, uh, this program uh, and has since written a novel uh, talking about the, uh, the, the program. It's sort of written in the first person perspective of the Tamarins themselves. Um, it's an interesting exercise if you want to pick it up and have a read. Uh, it's they're, they're, they're often um, making wry observations about the scientists who are doing these strange things to them um, and the observations of the sexual behaviour of the scientists in relation to their own. So there's a lot going on in, um, in 13 gold monkeys. Um, so uh, have a look at it. Um, so, okay. The... Um, as you, sorry, I just want to read from the appendix to the book as well, just to give you an idea of, of, of the, uh, what went on in the early stages of, of this project. So this is uh, Beck's record of the first, uh, the first uh, reintroduction, first reintroduction, with the, the Olympia family as of June 1984. 01, mum. Female, five years old, released in the quarry area of the Poco de Santos Reserve on 7 December 1984, disappeared on 8 December. Dad, male, six years old, released in the quarry area of the reserve on 7 December, eaten by a boa constrictor on 9 December. Pandora, female, 18 months old, introduced to S4 on the 1st, released with S4 on a ranch, forming the Red River Group, give birth to twins. <coughs> Prometheus, male, 18 months old, released on 7 December in the quarry area, he paired up with 09. Here a female, 12 months old, killed on 7 December in the quarry area, killed, sorry, released on the 7th, killed by bees on 11 December. Hercules male, 12 months old, released on the 7th, disappeared in a group encounter on the 9th, found dead of starvation on the 12th of December. So these, these guys didn't last very long. Um, and I think we need to uh, be able to, to think about and understand why that is, and also to, to stay with that fact I think uh, about these, these these projects. I think it, it's very easy to um, to dismiss the such sacrifice uh, and and so on. Um, I think the the I think it's not only an ethical but also an ontological question about why why does this why does this happen? Um, okay, so um, Tom was talking the other day about the way in which experiments. Um, and management can and can you know might go together. Um, I find the, re the the reporting on these reintroductions very strange when it when it comes in these experimental uh, terms. So this is, for example, one of the one of the reports uh, on the behavioural deficiencies in reintroduced golden line tamarins, which he says are clues to the effects of successful adaptation to the zoo environment. Um, and this is the logic. So, founding that 60% are lost in the first post-release year, therefore uh, it must be the case that many survival critical behaviours may be learned. Um, I, I, I find it strange that this is, this is something that must be experimentally verified in this way, uh, that this, this isn't something we, we already might know about, uh, about primates, uh, that that uh, there is an aspect of learning and culture to their ability to survive in a certain way, and that uh, having been uh, having been bred in zoos could compromise that. Um, and so, with, with this, we have these this strange picture of reintroduction uh, uh, programs as experiments, which through the deaths of the animals that we put out there, we discover, oh, they weren't prepared for you know for this life. Um, uh, yeah, why, um, 
This is uh, from one of Lestelle's critiques of uh, various forms of experimentation in the history of animal behavior. And um, the, you'll be familiar with Harlow's experiments. Why, why do we need to demonstrate, for example, that, that uh, certain animals need, to, uh, need the love of their parents? And how do, why do we need to demonstrate this by separating them? Um, I, think, I think similar questions can be asked. Okay, this is something, for example, that Heidegger could have told you uh, in, the, in the mid 20th century. It's ridiculous to believe that, for example, surplus zoo lions should be taken to Africa and released there, and he expanded on this to other animals. In practice, this remarkable experiment would scarcely bear repeating. It usually means a painful death for the animals involved. I mean, he dismissed the idea quite simply uh, in that way. And it's, um, but it is repeated over and over again until we get to the point where we're understanding different aspects of the behavior of the animals that, um, that uh, contribute to their ability to survive in a different environment. Um, and I think what, uh, what's so interesting about the, the changes is, is that the zoos have gone from an institution in which uh, death is something that is avoided, in which uh, predation and starvation are the two things that zoos do not allow to happen, right? So we're, we're having animals that we want to present as natural in their behaviours in every way except for uh, we protect them from predators and we, we uh, supply them with food, right? And so this is the, the sort of the, the 20th century model of how a zoo presents itself. Um, when they become involved in uh, uh, conservation programs of, of reintroduction, the model of how we must relate to these animals changes in that it's precisely this um, lack of a relationship to death that the animals have that has uh, led to the change in behavioural ability. They don't know how to flee from predators and they don't know how to forage for their own food. Um, uh, that means that they are um, incapable of surviving in the wild. So we go from, this is Hedegaard's list of the different types of death that could occur due to behaviour and the ways in which we must uh, prevent all of this from happening. Um, and then we go uh, from that to uh, death becoming something that must be uh, trained into the animals. And so they have uh, the enrichment programs, boot camps in which they try to prepare them uh, more to, to, for fleeing from predators and, and finding their own food. So the naturalness of the of the zoo animals or the artifice of the zoo animals, the meaning of it changes depending on what the, the um, goal of the care is. All right. I wanted to quickly just uh, uh, to try to think this through in terms of uh, some of Debbie's work in which she talks about uh, doubled up uh, death work or the doubling up of death, right? Um, which you would have heard, heard a bit about on uh, uh, the other day, the idea that um, Death is, death is actually a part of life, right? And the relationship to death of the animals and ourselves is, is, is part of life. And so part of the problem with uh, genocidal, colonial and uh, extinction practices is, is that is not just that there is death, but that it transforms the, uh, the, relationship, the relationship to death and the um, ability of death to be a part of the, uh, the lives of, of people and of animals. Um, doubling up becomes an amplification of death so that it exceeds the balance with life and becomes a self-amplifying process. Um, part of what I want to say about what occurs in, in zoos is that not only do the animals lose the re their own relationship to, to death and the need to um, re be able to flee from predators and so on, they also re lose, lose their relationship to their dead, right, to their ancestors, to uh, the animals that may have... Uh, taught them how to survive in the wild. So the, the ancestral work of learning how to, uh, how to survive, that's been lost. There is a form of um, cutting off of the relationship to uh, the, the evolutionary past of the animals that occurs in captivity. And they no longer have a relationship to their own dead, to their own ancestors. Um, so is there, another way of, is there another way of thinking about uh, these animals? Um, so the idea of uh, plasticity comes up. Um, this is a, a passage from Beck's novel in which uh, they have released their animals and discovered that uh, they're, not, they're not surviving, uh, they're not behaving as they would like to. Like to. So Peter, who's the, an expert in uh, wild tamarins, 
Peter dropped a bomb. Ira, these are plastic monkeys, he said. Nothing they are doing resembles a wild Miko. Ira looked at Peter as he hit him in the head with a board. Anger welled in his throat and then he felt sad and embarrassed. What do you mean, Ira said. Nobody's using natural vegetation. Ira is the stand-in for Beck in the novel. Ira and Erica were utterly deflated. They're the, the zoo carers who are uh, part of the reintroduction program. They'd worked for three months to train these tamarins, prepare them for life in the wild, and the world's expert on wild tamarins had just called them plastic monkeys. Um, and so you have this idea of plasticity as in being a toy or a, you know, some sort of uh, frozen in place. These monkeys no longer have the adaptability to, uh, to, to survive in the wild. Um, but plasticity, as we know, is also a concept of movability. And, and I think there's been a lot of work in neuroscience recently and, and other behaviour sciences about thinking about the plasticity of the brain and its ability to adapt. Um, so uh, rather than thinking of... Uh, to animals and practices in terms of the just simply artifice uh, as the first couple of people that I quoted uh, wanted to paint the picture that these are just artifacts. Um, I think we need to be able to uh, think about the plasticity of animals um, but not simply in uh, uh, behavioural terms that would, that would uh, uh, collapse it into the, simply the natural. I think we need to um, maintain the perspective of of the, the political and human animal community uh, domain. If, if behaviour has become this domain for uh, intervention on behalf of scientists and managers, if we, we cannot get away from the fact that we in, are in a community with these animals and in which their behaviour is affected by what we do, the types of buildings we construct, the, you know, the way in which we affect their habitat, we are impacting upon their behaviours in all sorts of ways. So we need to ask the question of plasticity uh, in a political sense. And so uh, what I want to do is um, to develop uh, from the work of a, a philosopher, Catherine Malibu, who, who uh, is talking about neuroplasticity in, uh, in terms of human politics and trying to politicise the question of the plasticity of our brains. And I think I need, we need to politicise this question as it applies to, uh, to animals as well. Um, so the title of the book is What Should We Do? with our brain. What should we do, she asked, with all this potential within us? What should we do with this genetically free field? What should we do with this idea of a truly living brain? Modification of synaptic efficacy, as we will see, is already implicated in the most elementary level of animal life, and thus appears today to be one of the fundamental characteristics of living beings. A fragile brain which depends on us as much as we depend on it. The dizzying reciprocity of reception, donation, and suspension of form that outlines the new structure of consciousness. Um, and I guess I just want to leave it by asking this question of uh, what should we do with animal brains? All right, thanks.